Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Builtor webinar, Building an Infrastructure for Efficiency and Security, Adjusting for Vulnerabilities of the BYOD and Remote Workforces. <clears throat> I'm Gail Persichelli, and I'll be serving as your moderator. Our speaker today is Paul Chiazio, who is the co-founder and CEO of TrueShield Security Solutions, where he develops corporate strategy and leads the company's technical product and services development efforts. I want to thank, thank TrueShield for sponsoring today's webinar. Our presentation today will run about 45 to 60 minutes, and we ask that you submit all questions to the Q&A box, and if those are not answered during the presentation, they will be addressed at the end. Before we start, please know that we are recording today's webinar, and we'll post a link to our website under recordings shortly after today's presentation. I will now turn the webinar over to Paul. Thanks, Gil, um, and thanks to everybody who is attending today to uh, this next in the uh, informational series of webinars that we do for ILTA. Uh, big thanks to ILTA and to Gail for uh, putting these programs together. Uh, hopefully, it's a mechanism that we can deliver some useful information to the audience out there. So the topic today is about how to build your infrastructure so that you can support a mobile workforce securely. Um, I think many of the attendees, probably all of you guys, have had either your attorneys or perhaps some support staff asking about how you could support them working remotely or even potentially just traveling to client sites. And uh, there are ways to do that securely, uh, but there are also certainly ways to do that insecurely. And uh, what I'm hopeful to do today is help you avoid some of those pitfalls by talking to you about uh, things that you can do to put yourself a little bit ahead of the game with respect to securing your infrastructure uh, so that you can do it right the first time and, and hopefully not have any issues or incidents that might arise if you don't. Um, so, with that said, I'll step through the agenda here. I'm going to introduce you a little bit to me and to my company here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the benefits and drawbacks of mobility. Um, obviously, there are pluses and minuses to, uh, uh, to having a mobile workforce. We'll try to drill into each of those a little bit and uh, how they impact the approaches that we'll talk then uh, about next. Uh, those approaches are going to center around three things. Uh, really, we're going to be talking about cloud service providers. We're going to be talking about bring your own desktop or bring your own device. And we're going to be talking about firm furnished equipment or just equipment that the firm uh, purchases and gives to the employees so that they can travel and, and work remotely. And then we're going to then talk about how to do all that securely. And hopefully we'll leave you guys with some recommendations on what the best approach is, at least from our perspective, on how to do this uh, you know, correctly uh, and securely to begin with. So um, again, uh, my name is Paul Cayazzo. Uh, I am co-founder and CEO, but I'm also a technical guy. So if anybody out there has some technical questions, you can feel free to ask those in the question box. I can uh, uh, get to those. And if not, uh, during the webinar, uh, if you'd like, you can feel free to reach out to me either via email, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, or follow me on Twitter. Uh, one thing about our uh, corporate LinkedIn profile at TrueShield, we do publish a fair amount of content with respect to the security industry, uh, specific around how it impacts the legal industry as well. So if uh, you're interested in security at a high level, or, or really even want to get down into the weeds with some granular technical uh, threat alerts and things along those lines, you can follow us there and, and uh, learn a little bit more about what it is that we see. Um, and uh, the things that we do at TrueShield, um, so we're a global company. We're based in Washington, D.C., but we have clients around the world. Uh, we cater to a couple of industries, mostly uh, government, financial services, and, of course, the legal industry. Um, the services that we provide to all of those really center around a couple things, professional services and managed services. On the professional services side of the house, we do all sorts of penetration testing and risk assessments and security consulting, uh, do things like ISO 27001 implementations, things along those lines. Um, and also compromise assessments to determine if you, you know, got a, a threat actor already in your environment. Um, and then on our managed services side, we do 24-7 monitoring and alerting uh, so we can tell what the bad guys are actually attempting to do against your environments. Um, and I think that's actually a useful frame of reference to give you guys so you understand how we're looking at this problem. Uh, we're, we're really... Um, I think very tactically uh, able to see what the bad guys are doing, um, and that helps us give our clients a little bit better guidance uh, to overcome some of those practical, real-world threat scenarios, especially when it comes to things like uh, a mobile workforce. Um, now I mentioned we're going to be talking about benefits and drawbacks of a mobile workforce, but I wagered a, a pretty significant sum of money that most of the CIOs and, and senior IT guys and, and, and uh, gals on the phone have probably been asked questions by either your executive directors or perhaps your partners or even you know just you know attorneys in your firm how they can be more effective in, in a kind of a mobile uh, um, you know, a model. 
Uh, I think at, at um, a high level, you see much of the industry moving towards mobile workforce, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, first off, I think there's you know, significant productivity improvements that could be realized, but I think additionally, just as a, a, a way of making your environment more um, you know, friendly to your employees, uh, you're being asked more and more often to support kind of that mobility uh, um, approach to, to working. Um, so again, we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits and the drawbacks of that. Um, I'm going to start with the benefits. So first off, recruiting. Uh, this might be you know, somewhat obvious, but if you have a highly mobile environment that allows your employees to work either from home um, or perhaps on the other side of the country, uh, that makes you a lot more attractive to potential employees. And you may be able to find pockets of talent uh, elsewhere uh, outside of your kind of core uh, service area that you might be able to, to attract the, the right kind of people to your team. We've certainly seen this on our side as a cybersecurity company. Um, you know, we're in Washington, D.C., where there's a, a pretty significant number of cyber uh, security professionals. However, you know, we're in a, um, you know, the, the way that we operate, we don't necessarily need to have our entire workforce here in the office. And so that enables us to go and recruit across a much wider uh, uh, swath of the world than what we'd be able to do if everybody had to be here at headquarters. And that really just makes us, uh, you know, more attractive to potential employees and also just a more effective company at being able to deliver the services that we need to do. And that's certainly not limited to a company like ours. A law firm could be you know, identical to that. Most of the um, you know, uh, larger law firms are going to have you know, uh, multiple satellite offices anyway. Uh, certainly those on like the AMLA 200 are, are, are almost certainly going to have multiple offices around the country or perhaps even around the world. And tying all those organizations together is also something that uh, we can talk a little bit about here today as well. But it really just makes you more attractive to potential employees and also uh, when it comes to employee retention. Um, obviously, it's a very competitive uh, labor market out there, um, and uh, you know, trying to retain those those good employees, those, those highly productive employees, is always a challenge. Uh, and actually, making mobility easy for them is a way that that uh, uh, you can you can help towards that. Uh, there have been some uh, pretty interesting studies uh, that were were done by both uh, that Birchek and Nebel organization that's on the screen there, as well as Gartner um, and and some other organizations like Gallup and and uh, other research organizations that have found that. Uh, granting users, granting your employees the ability to work from wherever they are, uh, it actually has a pretty profound positive impact on their productivity. Um, and not just productivity, but also the employee satisfaction component. An employee satisfaction really, at the end of the day, you know, leads to you know, a much more efficient organization uh, where people are kind of happy to do the work. Um, and that's you know, obviously a, a big win for your law firm. Uh, whether or not we're talking about you know, uh, additional billable hours for your attorneys or the ability for your IT or IT security support staff to be able to access the environment and do their jobs, you know, from wherever, that just makes you, you know, a better firm at the end of the day. Um, there are also some potential financial gains from, from uh, offering uh, mobility by virtue of bring your own device. And I say potential for a couple of reasons. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but there are actually, you, you could realize a, a capital expenditure savings uh, via a bring your own device model. Um, bring your own device really, obviously, you guys are probably aware of this, but it really just means allowing your employees to use their own personally owned uh, laptops or mobile phones or any other compute device to access uh, firm uh, uh, information assets. So, you know, I guess logically, if you don't have to purchase the laptop or the mobile phone for that employee, there's a potential cost savings right there. Um, and uh, it may seem like there's almost a guaranteed cost savings, but there are potentially some hidden costs when you start really kind of peeling back the onion with respect to how you actually uh, have to uh, um, build your infrastructure out to support that. So potential capital expenditure savings, but I think you'll find that that uh, potential might be uh, somewhat, somewhat minimized, somewhat mitigated by some of those other concerns. Um, those other concerns really are around the drawbacks. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, we hear this a lot from our law firm partners uh, when we get asked about bring your own device, is what about, what about privacy concerns? You know, if we have an employee-owned device that we potentially, you know, need to, uh, um, you know, seize or do some investigation upon, you know, where is the line drawn between that employee's data and the firm's data? Um, and that can be a really difficult question to answer if you haven't thought about how your firm goes about handling these sort of privacy concerns uh, through things like your employee rules of behavior um, and your information security policy uh, that your employees would then have to read and understand and, and uh, you know, uh, sign off on, which is really where you find that rules of behavior. So what I see most often with respect to the concerns around this are uh, let's say a user um, has a you know, MacBook that they use to access 
um, you know, uh, maybe some matter data for a particular client, and they lose that laptop or the laptop gets stolen, and there's a lot of uh, you know sensitive client information on it. Uh, if the firm has a mobile device management solution that allows you to, from a technical standpoint, remotely you know wipe the hard drive of that device, then the risk to the firm is mitigated. But at the end of the day, uh, that's um, you know you have to have done that ahead of time, uh, first off, and then secondly, um, if you know the employee were to get that device back, you you've effectively rendered it a brick, and uh, um, you know potentially also lost that user's or that that, that individual's own personal data, um, things like you know maybe their family picture album, something like that, which could be high sentimental value to a person. Um, and those are you know uh, potentially uh, uh, considerations that you need to be thinking about as you're looking at how your firm goes about handling uh, mobility for your employees. The other aspect of privacy obviously uh, relates to monitoring. Um, if you're using a firm-owned or firm-furnished laptop or mobile phone, um, there's, I think, maybe an inherent understanding that uh, your, the, the employee uh, is, is potentially going to be monitored, especially if it's in the information security policy and, and rules of behavior that I mentioned. But if they're using their own device, uh, there's sometimes a perception on the employee or the user side that, you know, what, what they do on their device is their business and uh, not necessarily yours to be monitoring. Uh, so that's a concern that in some organizations, if you're trying to overcome that initial hurdle to implement uh, mobility within your environment, something to think about, uh, certainly something for your internal counsel, your general counsel to be looking at. Um, I definitely have seen uh, lawsuits from employees against their own employers with respect to monitoring. Uh, and uh, I've seen a lot of that in the government also, where uh, employees had to um, you know, sign off on the fact that they're going to be monitored um, simply because they're, they're, you know, there had been some incidents where they didn't specifically let people know that they were monitoring them and, and therefore they felt their privacy was violated. Um, there's some pretty good precedent now for uh, obviously for organizations to be monitoring uh, their own networks um, and for activities that employees are, are undertaking on their networks and with their devices. But again, once you throw that bring your own device wrinkle into it, it's just an added uh, concern that you've got to be managing uh, within your information security policy. Uh, secondly to that, you know, I think again, fairly obvious, data security uh, can be a little bit more challenging to implement when you've got a bring your own device model. Uh, you know, your data is likely going to reside within the uh, on-premise uh, infrastructure, potentially within a cloud service provider, um, and brokering access to that stuff in a secure manner is definitely going to be more challenging. Um, uh, and I think a lot of that revolves around the fact that if there's a, um, uh, a bring your own device approach to mobility, um, the level of security controls on those employee-owned devices is going to be a potential unknown um, at best, and you know, could be a very highly insecure device kind of at worst. I, uh, examples that I've seen are, you know, when, again, let's say one of your attorneys has a MacBook that they allow, you know, their daughter to surf Facebook on, and uh, um, unfortunately that individual downloads, a, you know, a virus or maybe some ransomware or something like that, um, which when connected to the firm's VPN, for instance, kind of goes wild and locks up the internal organization. I've seen similar things like that happen, and uh, it's obviously a big concern because it's going to be harder for you as uh, security professionals to levy security controls on employee-owned devices unless you've kind of given this some forethought. So that's one of those big considerations to be thinking about with respect to how controls are standardized across uh, both your firm furnished equipment internal to the, the uh, uh, into the firm and also the employee owned devices that are being used to access uh, firm information assets. Um, I mentioned policy implications, but it really can't be undersold. Uh, it's one of those things that if you, uh, you know, kind of implement a, a mobile workforce without really doing the, the homework on the policy implications of that, then you're going to wind up in a situation where you maybe don't have the authority to monitor what the employees are doing, or you perhaps don't have the authority to seize an employee-owned device even if there's a you know, security incident that takes place on it. Um, and then additionally, you may not have the ability to you know, levy any sort of consequence on the employee that acts either you know, maliciously or against the rules of behavior if they're using their own employee-owned device and you haven't specifically baked that into the policy. Um, there's also some remote access and access control concerns that you're going to have to be thinking about when you start looking at your information security policy. And typically, we, we recommend that uh, firms take a look at those policies at least on an annual basis or whenever there's a significant enough change to the environment that uh, it warrants an update. So if you're looking at doing um, you know, mobility for the first time, definitely dust off your information security policy. Pull it out, take a look at um, you know, how you're uh, specifically calling out things like monitoring and things like uh, uh, control implementation on those devices. And I would also highly recommend running it by your internal counsel, especially when it comes to that monitoring component. 
Um, the other aspect of it, and I think you know, a lot of you technology people out on the phone would probably agree with this, the behavior changes are usually the hardest part. The, the technical aspect is not necessarily something that you couldn't overcome those challenges, but getting people to change their behavior, you know, people are stubborn, right? I think you guys have probably all seen that. And stubborn, stubbornness is kind of hard to uh, um, you know, change those sorts of behavior. The way that we recommend you do that, obviously, is through training. Uh, let uh, employees know how they should be accessing the firm information assets securely, uh, whether they're you know, on-premise, within the environment, on your local area network, or remote. Um, that training should be regular. You know, I think a lot of organizations just do security awareness training as a kind of a, I have to check the box that I train somebody once per year, and then maybe it's a half hour, you know, real, real basic thing, and isn't necessarily really tailored to how your organization you know, brokers access to information. Uh, it really should be, especially if you're making a big change in implementing uh, uh, kind of a, a, mobile, a mobility, or bring your own desktop, or even a you know a cloud service provider uh, um, a basis uh, for for mobile workforce. There's behavior changes that are going to have to take place on your client or on your uh, employee side, and training them how to do that uh, is something that that investment in training will pay off in the long run with fewer security incidents. Um, the next one there, logging and monitoring for security events. This is one of those technically challenging components um, because if you have a mobile workforce, um, and especially if you add the wrinkle of bring your own device, and those those uh, employees are you know wherever in the world accessing your information, um, it, it's it's challenging to do the real time security monitoring and logging that your clients are probably asking you to do. Um, so if you're you know at Starbucks or your attorneys are at Starbucks and accessing matter information over you know, public Wi-Fi, for instance, and you probably, a lot of people just shuddered at the thought of that, but um, I'm sure it happens on a daily basis within most of your firms. Um, that logging that and monitoring for that sort of thing is something that is, is um, it's challenging to do. There are uh, mechanisms to do it, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that when we get to the secure approaches to mobility later, but it's certainly a consideration for you to be thinking about while you're, you're looking at uh, um, how to go forward with this. And then I mentioned that the capital expense savings may be misleading. And that really is is because of um, largely because of those couple preceding uh, items there. So if you're looking at saving money on uh, not having to buy laptops or not having to buy you know mobile phones for your, your workforce, you still have to you know refresh your policy to support that. And there's obviously costs associated with that. You still have to uh, deploy standard security controls to those employee-owned devices, which can be technically challenging. There are certainly tools to do it, but they're not free. Um, and then the same thing goes for the security monitoring and logging. Uh, again, there are tools which will support that same level of control that you likely have on your internal assets, but they can be costly to implement um, and likely are going to require some architecture changes to support them. Uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the architecture which is needed to support that as we get a little bit further on into this. But those are certainly some things to be thinking about when, when you're looking at kind of the, the, the pros and cons of, of mobile workforce. In my personal opinion, I feel like the pros vastly outweigh the cons. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of benefit from having a mobile workforce and really having employees that are able to get out in front of the clients and still be you know, as productive as if they were uh, here on site. Um, but at the same time, we had to do quite a bit of thinking about how do we do this securely and protect our client data. And, and that, that kind of paradigm is no different with the security company versus a, a law firm. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's your, your mandate by the ADA model rule 1.6C to protect client information regardless of where it's being stored or processed. And so these are heavy implications upon, upon your requirements there. Um, okay, so we'll talk a little bit now about approaches to mobility, and there are several that we're really going to drill into here, which are by and large the most commonly seen uh, approaches. Um, first that we're going to look at is cloud-based systems. So there are a, a, a plethora of uh, software as a service providers or cloud-based data repository providers that are out there, um, and this can be a great way to give your mobile workforce access to the information they need uh, wherever they're at. Um, there's, um, again, obviously there's pluses and minuses to any of these approaches, um, and I can talk a little bit about each of those, but some of the different things that you're typically going to see in a law firm environment are things like data repositories like Box or Dropbox or sometimes OneDrive, especially uh, for kind of those highly, um, you know, Microsoft-reliant organizations. OneDrive is something we see more and more of, uh, even uh, more so when we see the uptake in Office 360, uh, which some of you guys are maybe debating whether or not to move to. Um, we also see a lot of uh, cloud-based applications that are in use within uh, law firms um, at, like, you know, Salesforce from a customer relationship management or kind of a, a customer experience management uh, uh, model. 
uh, Recommind and some other e-discovery uh, sort of tools that have a cloud-based component to it, um, which it certainly is going to make the act of the e-discovery and, and facilitating that while on client premises a whole heck of a lot easier. Um, but at the same time, there are, there are you know, some obvious security concerns around uh, having that data stored in the cloud. Um, and, and how to access that stuff securely and broker access it to, uh, to it securely. And uh, that's, those are you know, certainly concerns for you guys to be thinking about. But you know, the plus side with this is a very high degree of interoperability. Doesn't really matter if your employees are within your law firm or you know, in, uh, I was gonna say China, but China blocks access to a lot of these or you know, perhaps Eastern Europe or any, any place in the world and using any sort of device, it's likely supported by you know, your, your good cloud-based systems. And so that interoperability can make your jobs as IT and IT security professionals so much more easy because you don't necessarily have to worry about you know, plugins or updates uh, for specific uh, you know, legacy applications or anything like that because it's all the cloud service providers problem to solve. Uh, and by and large, they have solved that, which is kind of what makes them compelling offerings within their own particular space. Um, so that aspect of it makes your job easier. The security aspect of it probably makes your job harder though. Um, and uh, a lot of that comes down to taking a look at how your contracts with your cloud service providers are, are structured um, and making sure that you've got uh, considerations within those contracts for security controls and for security monitoring. Uh, and if they're not written into the contract, you're gonna have a hard time later on down the line. Uh, we'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a couple more slides, but that's one thing to be considering as you're looking at pros and cons of, of cloud-based systems. Um, another con uh, is that a lot of the control uh, over your information um, and over how your information is accessed, you're kind of freely giving up to the cloud service provider. Um, you may still be able to uh, implement things like role-based access controls with cloud-based systems, um, but not all cloud, uh, cloud service providers are kind of at the same level with respect to uh, role-based access controls, and not all of them have gone through even an internal security assessment. Um, and, and so you're operating in somewhat of an unknown with respect to how uh, the cloud service provider has structured their own internal security controls. Um, and, and I think that's a pretty common facet across the cloud industry, uh, regardless of kind of what the client industry looks like, whether it's healthcare or legal or government, uh, everybody's fighting that same battle. It, it can be somewhat difficult to get the cloud service providers to um, kind of air their dirty laundry or show you what their security controls look like or even what the results of a recent security assessment or vulnerability test might, might look like. Uh, getting those results on a regular basis so that you can keep current with their current security posture is usually even harder. Uh, so that's another thing to be thinking about as you're looking about at um, either implementing a, a, a CSP or if you're looking at um, you know, putting data out in the cloud, how that cloud service provider uh, um, secures your data in the cloud should be a big concern for you. And uh, um, it doesn't necessarily trump the interoperability component, uh, but it's something to be thinking about when you're uh, considering this as a, as a potential viable mechanism for um, uh, enabling a mobile workforce. Uh, my opinion, again, this is an area where if done smartly, if done securely, is certainly uh, um, you know, a highly viable uh, potential solution. Uh, we certainly use uh, a number of cloud service uh, providers within our own infrastructure here, and I see more and more law firms using things like Office 360. Um, we see a lot of Box and Dropbox. Um, I, I have more concerns around the data repository stuff than I do about the software as a service like Office 360, uh, because the data in the cloud, Box, Dropbox, et cetera, serve as a great side channel um, or a way that a data could be exfiltrated from your law firm uh, without going through your security controls, especially if uh, you haven't done that securely. So again, there's an area where some additional monitoring could help solve some of those problems um, with respect to how people are accessing those different uh, document repositories, or even when they are, or from where they are. Um, and again, we'll talk more about uh, you know, secure solutions overlaying uh, this approach a little bit later down the line. But again, some things to think about there. Um, Another approach is just simply firm furnished equipment. You know, you want your uh, attorneys and your employees to be able to uh, work remotely, so you buy them a laptop or buy them a smartphone or, or a tablet and allow them to work remotely. Um, now, I think there are, uh, the, the pros to this are that you can very granularly decide the security control architecture for those individual devices, and you can make them mirror identically uh, the security controls on your internal devices. Um, there's obviously a big drawback here, and that's the, the significant cost of, uh, of having to buy everybody a, uh, a laptop and, and or a mobile phone. 
Uh, what I see more and more firms doing is getting away from buying any desktops whatsoever. And again, that's not just law firms. That's probably most organizations. Um, I think there was a point in time where, you know, everybody was buying desktops and very few laptops because laptops were, you know, and still are more expensive than their desktop counterparts. But the benefits of this kind of mobility uh, um, component of it, I think, outweigh the additional cost that you'll typically find by purchasing laptops. So as firms go through tech refreshes, uh, more and more are buying laptops and allowing individuals to work remotely. Uh, now how that works, uh, when your attorney gets out to the field, uh, they're likely gonna connect back to you via a remote access VPN. Um, if you don't have uh, you know, pretty good remote access VPN set up there, you know, your firewall can handle that for you. Uh, that's how we see most of it uh, done. Uh, there's also VPN concentrators for larger organizations that have you know, many hundreds or perhaps a thousand uh, remote users needing to access VPN on a regular basis. Um, most of the time we see that handled at the edge firewall uh, and um, you know, for instance, let's say you've got a Cisco ASA firewall at your network edge, um, you configure a remote access uh, account for the individuals that need it, uh, they install a mobility client upon their device, uh, that client initiates a connection with that edge firewall and then secures communication between the, the mobile device and your internal network. Um, and at that point, you know, it's effectively operating as though it's on your internal network. Um, and you know, there are some clear drawbacks to that too, if you think about it, because if that individual, uh, let's say they're operating on a uh, you know, potentially hostile network, um, or in a part of the world where you can expect communications to be intercepted, um, or man in the middle attack or things like that, if they're connected to your internal infrastructure, um, you know, there's potential for some elevated uh, access gain to an attacker uh, via that VPN. Uh, mostly mitigated by uh, kind of modern uh, VPN architecture and uh, the VPN uh, uh, encryption in and of itself, uh, but it's still a concern to be, to be mindful of. Uh, the other thing about um, the firm furnished equipment that you've got to be thinking about is, again, we're going to tie back to that monitoring of these devices as they're out in the field. Um, and the potential need to have to brick or wipe or you know, delete a device uh, that's been compromised out in the field. Uh, now the ways to do that, again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about when we get to secure approaches, but if you haven't already looked at a mobile device management solution for your firm, you probably should be uh, looking at that later. Uh, that's, that's one thing that's certainly gonna um, bridge the gap between the security controls that you'll have inside your environment and the security controls that you'll, you'll have to apply uh, to those mobile users. Um, but one way or another, uh, this is a, a mechanism that um, your employees can use to access your internal assets just like if they're on the network locally. Uh, the other thing about this, and you know, it's probably obvious, um, but the firm furnished equipment, regardless of where it is, can easily access all of your information that's out in the cloud just as well as it could as if it's in the internal environment. And that's uh, kind of a teaser to what we'll recommend is the best approach a little bit later, um, which is a blend of, of all of these different approaches. So firm furnished equipment, big pluses are you have a high degree of control over the security controls on each of those individual devices, but you also have a higher cost associated with it. Um, so how do you reduce that cost? Well, you can always allow your employees to use their own devices, and that's the BYOD approach. Bring your own device. Uh, you've sometimes heard it called bring your own desktop. Somewhat of a misnomer because most of the time the employees aren't gonna be using a desktop, they're gonna be using a laptop or a mobile phone. Um, but it's, it's just like it says, uh, the employee brings their, his or her own uh, device um, and uses that to access the firm's information assets. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple different ways to do this as well. And I've seen firms do it both ways. It, and it's probably, um, it, it probably fairly well correlates to the size of the law firm. Um, but uh, some law firms uh, have um, uh, firm-owned equipment for use when in the office, or you know, likely to be a desktop, uh, for the monitor and kind of traditional computing environment, and then allow the employees to use whatever they want uh, to work remotely and then access the network via a VPN client. Um, other organizations, uh, the ones that are, I think, um, probably trying to save the most money, don't even buy the employee that, that uh, device for use inside the office. Just let them bring their own laptop and uh, uh, use that as though it were you know, their, their own and only in primary uh, computing device. Um, you know, again, that's an area where you're going to have significant capital expenditure cost savings, but there are going to be some drawbacks uh, similar to what we described earlier around a lack of control over the individual device. Um, and I think that's really the big concern for me with respect to bring your own device is that the firm really has a, a much more constrained ability to be able to exercise security control and authority over that device regardless of where it is. Um, so, you know, for instance, your information security policy, you may have a requirement in it to never connect to a public Wi-Fi. I hope you do. 
um, or you may have a requirement in there for complex passwords uh, to access the device. And you may also have a requirement for uh, encrypted hard drives. Now, if your employees are using their own devices, how do you go about implementing those controls over those employee-owned devices? And how do you verify at any given point in time that those controls are in place? Um, and also, how do you verify that your employee, who likely uh, has administrative level access over their own device, doesn't uh, move that device into a non-compliant state and then access your information assets uh, that way? So those are all questions that you need to be asking yourself as you're thinking about bringing your own device. There are ways to solve those problems, um, and those might include that mobile device management uh, solution I mentioned earlier. Uh, might also include something called a NAC, or a network access control. Uh, and that can be applied to the firm furnished equipment just as well as bring your own device. Um, my opinion, and uh, um, you know, we do this here at TrueShield, uh, we do allow employees to use their own devices in certain conditions. They, they have to sign off on an employee rules of behavior, uh, and we have to have a mobile device management solution on that device to allow us to inspect the security of it at any point in time. Um, but it's, a, I think, a pretty powerful way to allow the employee to operate in their preferred computing environment. Um, and that in and of itself, I think, yields some productivity improvements for us. Uh, so really what I mean by that is some people are comfortable in Windows, some are comfortable on a Mac, others are comfortable in a Linux environment. And allowing the employee to choose that, um, you know, it, it definitely makes them uh, a little bit happier. Uh, the, I think the negative implication of that, though, is the, it's sort of the inverse of the cloud system's interoperability. Uh, you have to have already done all that interoperability work within your internal environment to make sure that any firm hosted applications or anything along those lines will support all those different fielded infrastructure uh, on, uh, and employee-owned devices. And that can be challenging. Um, when you're talking about uh, standardized controls and things like security configuration baselines, um, if you have many different types of devices that are fielded, uh, it can be really difficult to arrive at a standard set of controls. Um, you know, if you have Mac users plus Windows users, even if it's firm furnished equipment, uh, doing something like a secure configuration baseline, you've just doubled your work because now you've got two platforms that uh, you need to worry about a secure configuration baseline for. And that also might mean a, a pretty significant uptick in administrative support for your IT staff. Um, because if they have to support, you know, Susie in accounting using her Windows device plus you know, Jim in marketing using his Mac uh, to access firm uh, uh, data um, or, you know, firm applications, your uh, support staff has to know how to troubleshoot both of those platforms. Um, and so drawing the line there in, in terms of support of what you will support when an employee uses their own device to access the, the network um, is something that you also need to be thinking about. Because, you know, again, you're, you're unless you're a, a, you have infinite assets and, and resources and, and you know, a huge number of people on the team that can actually support that sort of thing, you're going to get a ton of help desk calls from, from people using different computing platforms that you're going to need to have you know, troubleshooting trees for, and it's really not sustainable. Um, but if you draw the line in the sand that the uh, support that you're going to give the employee on device really stops and starts at the uh, um, access level and not at like the operating system or the application level, then you know, it's a little bit clearer, but you're still probably gonna get calls for support that you're, you're gonna have to field. So pros and cons there, like all of these. Um, but again, there are ways to do this stuff securely, and that's really what we're gonna address now. So if I were to poll the audience here, I would guess probably nine out of 10 are uh, using some sort of cloud service provider within their firm. Um, but I'd, I'd bet that the ones that are looking at a cloud access security broker within their firm is probably something like two or three out of ten. Uh, that's because this is a relatively new um, sort of niche within cloud computing, um, and it's really focused on how do we uh, broker access uh, securely to different cloud service providers uh, within our environment. So let's say you're a firm that uses Dropbox and um, you know, Office 365 and also some cloud-hosted e-discovery component. And internal to your environment, you use Active Directory for identification and authorization. Um, a cloud access security broker can effectively uh, help you get a little closer to single sign-on um, and to kind of federated identities and federated authorization within your environment. Uh, and it can give your security administrators um, a bit more of a single pane of glass for um, brokering access control to different cloud uh, uh, computing environments. And it can certainly make their jobs a little bit easier, especially when it comes to actually locking down access to data that's in the cloud. Um, 
that you know, uh, requires an additional investment uh, above and beyond just the cloud service itself, because none of those CASB, and that's the that's the cloud access security brokers called CASB. Um, that's how, the, what you know how those guys make money is is by uh, overlaying on top of your already existing cloud service providers. Um, they can sometimes be costly too, so it's something to consider when you're looking at your your overall IT spend and your overall IT strategy. If there's a, a big push within your firm to move towards cloud uh, for everything or you know as much as you possibly can, then you definitely want to be looking at something like that because at the end of the day, that's going to make your job uh, easier from an administrative standpoint and also uh, improve your security posture across all of your both on-premise and cloud-based information assets. Um, so something to certainly be considering. Uh, the other thing, obviously, and I say obviously, but I shake my head at the number of times I see this step skipped, is the due diligence component. Um, you know, hopefully most law firms, I think, are pretty accustomed to doing third-party vendor due diligence, um, but I think it's got to be even more granular and even more rigorous when we're talking about cloud uh, computing environments. Um, and there are a couple reasons for that. Um, I think the most um, material example for the law firm community would be an environment where, let's say you're using a software as a service organization that they have a security incident. Uh, and that security incident involves a data breach. Um, you know, how do they go about notifying you? Um, what are your uh, requirements that you're levying upon them for that notification? Um, how involved can you be in that investigation? Um, all those sorts of things. Have they had an external audit done? Um, are they things like SOC 2, Type 2 compliant? Have they even gone through that level of scrutiny of their own internal control environment? Um, all of those are questions that you should be asking them before you sign a contract. Uh, and some of the things that we recommend people to look at when they're doing that due diligence component are cloud service providers that have gone through the FedRAMP certification and uh, what FedRAMP is, is a, um, it's a federal government security control standard specifically applied to cloud computing. And it's really intended to um, help organizations identify those cloud service providers that have gone through a FISMA accreditation and authorization process. So basically, uh, their system has been approved to operate within the federal government. Um, a lot of times, those cloud service providers will operate one a government-focused environment that has been fed ramp and then one commercially focused environment that has not. Um, some don't. Some have one single you know, kind of unitary environment that um, is blessed for fed ramp compliance. Um, and you know, that generally means that those guys, regardless of which model, whether they've got commercial plus government or it's all just in one environment, that means that they've done that scrutiny. They've, they've gone through a, a high degree of documentation of their own internal security controls. Um, and they've had an external independent entity uh, verify that what they've got written down is actually in practice. Uh, that's a really important thing, uh, and especially as you start looking at control inheritance. Um, and control inheritance, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, are it's, it's when you start looking at your security policy, there are certain things when you're using cloud service providers that you're going to be responsible for doing, and certain things with respect to security controls that they are going to be responsible for doing that you are, in effect, inheriting the control from whatever the cloud service provider does for you. Um, and it's really important to identify which of those you're inheriting, which of those you have to provide. And I've seen a lot of people kind of skip that step and, and you know, they assume that Amazon is handling it for them, for instance, but they're not. And, and that's not something which ever is written in their contract. And um, that's an area where I've seen a lot of firms kind of make some mistakes. So really assess that the control inheritance and things like those certifications can really help. The LCCA is the um, Legal Cloud Computing Association, I believe is what that stands for. Um, and uh, that's a uh, an organization that's focused exclusively on the legal industry and, and exclusively on how cloud computing is done as it's applied to the legal industry. Um, they've got some standards and recommendations, and I'd, I'd recommend everybody on, in, in the audience today take a look at, at those standards because uh, they'll give you also some pretty good um, guidance with respect to, again, things to look for uh, when you're assessing a cloud service provider to, to help with, you know, again, this mobility component of your workforce. Um, I always recommend uh, during that due diligence process that in the contract that you sign with your, your cloud service provider, you explicitly uh, state your data security control requirements. You know, what, what level of security do you require on data at rest, data in transit? Uh, what level of access to logs do you have, to audit records, things like that? And then what are the incident response procedures that that cloud service provider subscribes to so that when there is an incident, you know, you know that you're going to be taken care of and you know that 
uh, you're going to be notified uh, um, when, when that happens. It's not a given that they're going to notify you. It really isn't. So it's something that um, uh, you have to explicitly list in your contracts. So uh, take that into account when you're looking at um, uh, your cloud service providers. You probably, uh, if you haven't done it already, you probably want to take a look at your contracts now uh, if this is something that's, that's a new consideration for you. And if, and if it is, I would, I would recommend you start with the incident response procedures. Uh, because those organizations that um, are not, you know, as security conscious, uh, that's the area where they probably get it wrong the most, is how do we, uh, you know, how do they notify you, uh, what access to uh, breach uh, or incident specific data do you have, um, and then, you know, how do you pivot that to be able to, to notify your clients uh, um, that their data has been breached because of the cloud service provider's negligence, what's your firm's liability when it comes to things like that, et cetera. Um, so it's so a big concerns, and these are not all solved problems yet. Um, so because cloud computing um, is is you know somewhat newer than you know kind of traditional on-premise computing, uh, and I think that's largely where those uh, those certifications that I mentioned earlier come into play. Uh, so so again, take a look at the LCCA, and if you're looking for cloud service providers for a specific niche or application as a service, you know look for ones that have gone through those processes, and and that's going to get you a little bit closer to. Uh, on-premise level of security with data out in the cloud. Um, so now we'll get back to how do you uh, um, enable that mobility within your workforce. And we talked a bit about firm furnished equipment earlier. Um, this is a simple concept. You, you buy a laptop, you secure it as though it's on your network, and then you issue it to the employee for them to use wherever they want. Simple concept. Um, probably the best security, um, and I say probably because it still relies upon you uh, having had, you know, put together a secure configuration baseline and applied it across all of your devices and something that you can, you know, monitor and scrutinize on a regular basis. Um, but that really does allow you to enforce the same level of security across all of your assets, uh, which should obviously be the goal. Uh, the other thing that it enables you to do is keep really good track of your inventory. Uh, and those hardware assets that are, uh, you know, fielded uh, are, um, you know, potentially continuing to check into your environment. You can assess those on a regular basis uh, when they check in, and that's what the mobile device management tool is for. Um, if you're not familiar with mobile device management, um, it's, um, you know, another enterprise class application that if you've got a pretty large number of uh, uh, mobile users, you certainly want to be looking at this. Uh, the best MDMs are those that will uh, integrate management of a mobile device like a laptop, as well as uh, management of a mobile device like a smartphone. Um, some of, are even cloud-based, those uh, mobile device management solutions. There are a couple pretty good ones that are cloud-based, so it's kind of a, a, a hybrid of the two uh, approaches that we talked about earlier. Nice thing about that cloud-based approach is that truly does not matter where that device is um, and how it's accessing the internet. If it's connected to the internet, it's effectively beaconing back to that cloud-based MDM. If it's internal to your environment, the MDM, uh, there are some architecture considerations to be thinking about. Uh, it's potentially likely that you might need to have an MDM device in your DMZ, your demilitarized zone, uh, that's accessible to those roaming devices so that when they're out in the field, even if they're not VPN back to you, they still have the ability to check into that MDM server, and that MDM server is going to be able to assess that the level of security on that device is still what you expect it to be. Uh, the other thing about MDM that it will allow you to do is um, even if a user has administrative level access uh, to a device, which I would recommend they don't, uh, I think a you know, security professional, you guys probably all know that, people should not have administrative access to their devices um, you know, at, at all unless it's absolutely necessary, and that's a very small percentage of the time. Uh, but the MDM, even if they do, will enable you to lock down certain controls, certain features, so that they can't be changed or if they are changed, the next time the MDM goes through an internal cycle or assesses that device itself, it will set everything back to the way it should be. Um, so it will help you enforce the security controls even if the device isn't connected to the network. Um, and that's obviously a very important thing um, regardless of where, uh, if they're connecting to uh, on-premise information assets or cloud-based information assets. Um, the other thing that an MDM will allow you to do is that remote brick that we talked about earlier, the remote wipe. Wipe, you know, wipe the hard drive, like remove all the data from it, or brick the device, you know, render it useless or obsolete. Um, and uh, that's a, um, you know, powerful feature. Uh, if a device gets stolen, which is, you know, one of the more common security incidents, you can really simply and easily just make that device totally useless to that attacker, to that th uh, thief, um, then they can't do anything with it. Effectively, it's just a piece of garbage at that point. Um, obviously, also with firm furnished equipment, whether or not you've got a mobile device management, uh, solution, you want to make sure that you're encrypting the hard drives, 
uh, and the MDM usually will enable you to do that natively directly within that tool. So that's another thing that you want to be thinking about. So even if that device is stolen, if the hard drive is encrypted, uh, it's a much, much more uh, um, difficult attack for them to get to any data actually on it. Typically what you'd see happen if, it, if the laptop isn't encrypted and they're just going to pop the hard drive out, mount it onto some other operating system and then access the data just as if it were right, you know, right there on their own system and bypass all the authentication stuff that your, your computer would typically have. Uh, that happens all the time. Uh, but if the hard drive's encrypted, they're not going to be able to do that. Um, and so obviously that's an important component of it, um, whether or not it's, it's a firm furnished equipment or if it's a bring your own device model. Um, this is obviously costly, right? So you've got to buy not only the laptop and the mobile phone, but you've also got to buy the mobile device solution. Um, you probably also want to invest in a network access control utility as well, or NAC. Uh, NAC is going to work hand in hand with MDM uh, to assess when the user connects via VPN to your internal environment, whether or not things like antivirus signatures are up to date, uh, whether or not the required patches are installed, things like that. Um, and those are certainly going to be technology components of your architecture that you're going to want to invest in. Um, you know, my opinion, again, this is probably the uh, highest uh, degree of security, but also certainly the highest cost. Um, and that's, I suppose, not uncommon uh, with respect to security paradigms. The, the, the most secure way is generally the most costly way to do it. Um, but there are other ways to do this securely, even if you remove that firm furnished equipment cost from the table and buy a bring your own device. Um, the thing about bring your own device is if you're truly uh, security conscious and truly focused on security, to do this right is complex. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, the most secure organizations that we work with, and you know, I'm thinking of you know, government organizations, uh, they simply don't do bring your own device, uh, just not something that's allowed um, because there's even that, you know, perhaps mitigated risk uh, via, uh, you know, complex security control ecosystem. There's still some risk that you can't, you know, mitigate down to zero uh, with bring your own device. Um, and so that's something to be, you know, considerate of if, if you're a law firm with a very, very low risk tolerance and very, very high security requirements, maybe super high profile clients or, you know, uh, um, you know, really high security control requirements internally. Uh, bring your own device, probably not a model that is going to be a good match uh, culturally with, with your law firm. Um, but uh, if you're, you know, for instance, your CFO uh, wants to balance risk against cost, this can be a way to bring costs down uh, potentially uh, while still provided you guys on the phone have done your homework uh, doing it securely. Um, so how do you do this securely? So uh, first off, the questions that I asked earlier when we talked about the approaches that privacy component um, and where do you draw the line between personal and business, this is something that each individual firm has to figure out for themselves. Uh, and there's no standard answer that I can give you with respect to that. Um, it's got to be written into your policy, though, that you reserve the right to monitor the employee's activity, even on their own devices, um, you know, anywhere and, and, and anytime. Um, and if it's not, then you're going to find, you know, uh, yourself in a really difficult situation if there is a security incident that you need to pull logs um, or something like that from an employee's device, or if you need to jump into their device during a live security incident, you truly might not have the authority to do that. Um, so that's again an area where your general counsel, and your your, uh, um, you know, your internal counsel wants to be looking at this sort of stuff alongside you. Um, and if you have something like an IT security steering committee, this is something that really needs to bubble up to that level uh, with respect to how you go about handling bringing your own device from a, a, a privacy standpoint. A uh, really important thing and something that you you just cannot overlook when you're when you're working on this stuff. Um, the other things that I talked about earlier still apply. Um, you know, regardless of whether it's a firm furnished equipment or mobile to, or, or I'm sorry, bring your own device, you want to have a mobile device management solution. Um, uh, and that mobile device management solution, how it's manifested in this regard, there's a uh, a client application that gets installed on the bring your own device or the employee on device that enables that check in to happen. And usually um, the way that it works is it'll create a sandbox uh, on that device so that the firm activity will only happen within that sandbox and uh, it's not possible to really break out of it to the other um, you know, computing resources on the device itself. So you know, for instance, um, you know, the, the example that I would give here is let's say there is some ransomware on that device itself. Um, theoretically, the sandbox should prevent that from spilling over into the firm environment uh, if the MDM is set up correctly. 
Um, I would say it's probably not foolproof though. And I've seen some attacks where um, attackers have been able to break out of sandboxes uh, and virtualized environments into the host operating system. Um, and so again, it's not something that you can mitigate that risk down to zero. Um, again, MVM here, you have the same sort of concerns around remote brick and a remote wipe. You wanna be able to have that capability, uh, but there are policy implications when you're talking about an employee-owned device. So, you know, the situation uh, that I mentioned earlier with the theft, um, let's take a different look at that. Let's say the device isn't stolen, but um, there's a, uh, um, let's say there's a virus outbreak on some employee-owned device and your mobile device management solution has the ability to remotely brick that device. The employee might be on the phone with you, but you have to render their device obsolete on the phone. That could be, you know, let's say it's a brand new MacBook, it's a three thousand dollar device that you've just, you know, effectively nuked. Um, who pays for the replacement device at that point? Is that the firm's responsibility or is that the employee's responsibility? Um, and uh, that's that's why it's really important to have counsel involved when you're looking at this sort of stuff. Again, technically not challenging to implement this. Um, the MDM is, uh, um, and, and there are, there are many out there, uh, and they're they're pretty mature technologies at this point and can help facilitate this stuff pretty seamlessly. Um, but the the policy considerations are something you want to be really mindful of. Um, the other one is that standard configuration. Again, um, if you've got bring your own device. Even with MDM, uh, you're going to have to have multiple different security baselines for different platforms that you support. And if you're a firm that already supports Mac plus Windows, then maybe this is a uh, um, lower hurdle for you to clear. But if you're not, and you've been traditionally just a Windows environment, you're going to have users that want to use their own Macs. And you're going to have to think about how you apply your standard security control baseline to a Mac uh, so that they can still operate uh, securely within your environment. Um, really important thing to be considering. So um, the other thing that will enable bring your own device, uh, device to work really well is a VDI or virtual desktop. Um, and this is how we do uh, um, secure mobility here uh, at TrueShield. So uh, VDI is a, effectively just a virtual operating system that gets installed on the employee-owned device. Um, and all of the corporate activity that happens happens within that virtual sandbox in that, in that VDI instance. So what, the way that that works within the, uh, kind of the, the, the user experience, they fire up the VDI. The VDI um, uh, creates a, a um, you know, guest uh, operating system or a guest computing environment within your you know, that computer. So it's effectively your computer at that point becomes a hypervisor with some virtual machines installed upon it. And that virtual machine is just a desktop. So it's a Windows 7 or you know, it might be Mac if you, if you want to use that. Or you know, maybe it's Windows 10 for you guys out there that are, are at, at the, I guess, the leading edge of the Windows environment. Um, and that device is configured with all of the routes and all of the you know, network connectivity requirements that enables all activity from that, that VDI instance to route back to your infrastructure so that all of the activity within that VDI instance effectively happens just as if it were on your local area network. Anything outside the VDI instance would route out the regular internet channel that that user is connected to. So whether they're at home or you know, wherever they are, all non-firm activity that happens outside VDI goes to you know, whatever the next hop is in, in that network chain, and anything that happens within the VDI routes directly back to your network edge, uh, to your, your, your VDI concentrator, um, and then that activity is brokered out to the rest of the internal environment from there. Very high secure, uh, highly secure way to do this um, because the VDI instances, uh, you can very, very granularly configure those to uh, re reinforce your internal security controls just as if it's a regular device on your network. And that makes it so that if you're, you know, if you have, again, all those controls I talked about earlier are not allowed to connect to public Wi-Fi, um, uh, high uh, complex password requirement, um, lockdown of USB drives, stuff like that. All of that can be baked right into the VDI configuration so that it's impossible for the user to drift the device out of compliance within your internal environment. Um, my opinion, this is the, the, the most secure way to do uh, mobile, mobile desktops and, and kind of mobile workforce. Um, obviously, there's a cost to that VDI implementation. And some of them, depending upon uh, what you're trying to do and what sort of access you're trying to broker and how many users you have, uh, could be costly, could be a significant cost. So uh, uh, you want to take a look at that when you're thinking about your budget for the next year, because this is something that's going to impact at a pretty significant level that budget. Um, so our recommendation uh, when you're looking at uh, um, how to do mobile workforce securely, and this is our recommendation from the perspective of a law firm that might not necessarily have the most extreme security requirements, we'd recommend you guys do take a look at bring your own device, but layer on top those other controls that we described. 
VDI is super critical if you're going to do bring your own desktop correctly or bring your own device correctly. Um, and MDM is also really critical to have the ability to do that remote break and remote wipe. Those two in tandem with the bring your own device will bring you up to an, a level of security approximate to what you have internal to your environment. You're not gonna be able to mitigate the risk down to zero, so you need to uh, communicate up to your steering committee and up to your board that you know, there is some residual risk from using a bring your own device model, but by virtue of implementing these other controls correctly and, and having the forethought of you know, doing this stuff and, and applying all the correct uh, policy uh, considerations, et cetera, you've, you've minimized that level of risk, but it's, it's again impossible to bring it down to zero. And then secondly, uh, when you're looking at your cloud-based uh, services, not just data repositories like what I've got here, also the this, this software as a service stuff as well, you've, um, you've looked for those who have the, the security uh, uh, certifications that I mentioned earlier, um, and you've looked at the contracts for those so that you have access to their internal security control documentation and preferably some sort of you know, regular check-in, maybe a quarterly vulnerability assessment report, something like that, uh, so that you can keep abreast of what the security posture is of your cloud service provider. And then couple with that, especially if you're a complex environment with multiple cloud service providers, couple with that a CASB vendor to help you um, federate identity and authorization to your different CSPs through a single interface within your own internal environment. And that's what we would consider to be kind of best of all uh, approaches brought together into something that Truly, any firm could implement this. Uh, it's not terribly complex. It's something that, again, you've got to do your homework ahead of time, and that preparation will set you up for success on, on, on the back end of it, so that if there is a security incident, you're able to respond to it, you're able to get the information you need to know the impact, and you're, at the same time, going to be minimizing the likelihood of a security incident from happening in the first place. So that's the content that I have for today. Um, if there are any uh, questions, um, I can take them. So, uh, Gail? Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Great presentation and True Shield for sponsoring. Uh, we are changing the way we work our evaluations now. Um, I'm going to put up a poll. If you could take a few minutes to answer a few questions based on the webinar today, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> if you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A box. And we do have a couple, and time is of the essence. So. Um, what are some easy wins when looking to strengthen cybersecurity within the BYOD devices? Okay, uh, easy, quick wins uh, with BYOD are implement a mobile device management system, um, and there are some relatively low cost ones that are out there uh, that MDM will enable you to get that um, ability to inspect the uh, mobile devices configuration at a, a lower cost than a full VDI implementation. Okay, great. Um, and real quick, how do I address client, third party, or vendor organizations about their vulnerabilities that might be putting my firm at risk? Yeah, that's a good one. And I think that's, that's an, an insightful question um, because that's what I was talking about earlier with the cloud service providers and the due diligence around them. If you haven't already talked to them and, and baked it into your contracts, if you have the ability to request that data on a regular basis, preferably at least quarterly, then you're going to be out to lunch on this. Um, so do the homework ahead of time and get that baked into your contracts with your vendors uh, so that they, you know, you have it uh, as a requirement of paying them. They have to provide you with that information on a regular basis. Uh, most third-party service providers will do that, um, but you have to ask the question. They're not going to offer it up to you. Okay, great. Um, and for those folks still out there, if you haven't um, given us your feedback on the evaluation poll, that would be great if you could take a few seconds to complete that. Otherwise, um, thanks everyone for attending today's ILTA webinar. We look forward to seeing everyone else on future webinars. Have a great day and happy holidays.